Good afternoon, uh, or good evening, depending where you're uh, watching from. My name is Steve Ross. I'm Distinguished Professor of History at the University of Southern California, and I am the Myron and Mary and uh, Kasdan Director of the Kasdan Institute for the Study of the Jewish Role in American Life. Uh, and I'm also the son of two Holocaust survivors, Benjamin and Esther Ross. And on behalf of the USC Kazan Institute, USC Hillel, and the USC Shoah Foundation, it's my great pleasure to welcome you today to our conversation, Holocaust Memory Across the Generations. Uh, and we are doing this in honor of yesterday's International uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, this is a very personal uh, Kazan event for me, uh, because originally it was going to be a conversation, a first-time conversation, between myself and my mother, who has never really spoken to me uh, comprehensively about what went on in the Holocaust. All she has said is, you've written about everything but me, why don't you write about me? Well, <clears throat> I wasn't writing about her, but we had agreed that I would interview her today. Uh, unfortunately, she died on November 16th at 99 and a half, and that half meant a great deal to her. So we want to use her Holocaust, um, some video clips from her Holocaust uh, interview at the Shoah Foundation in 1995. And uh, to help today, we are going to be uh, in discussion with Dr. Jennifer Rogers, the Director of Academic Programs at the USC Shoah Foundation. And our moderator today will be Dave Cohn, the Allen and Ruth Ziegler Executive Director of USC Hillel. And we are very fortunate to have three USC undergraduates who are third generation with us to join the conversation. And more than 75 years after the end of the Holocaust, the genocide of European Jewry remains a touchstone for modern history, international law, and numerous other fields of study. And as we face the passing of the generation of the direct witnesses and confront the new challenges with rising anti-Semitism, with Holocaust denial, the landscape of Holocaust memory is in fact changing. Today's discussion is going to focus on central questions of how second and third generation and beyond can ensure the preservation and relevance of Holocaust memory in a world without direct witnesses. And the format of today's event is going to be a conversation uh, amongst our panelists. And we encourage audience participation during the final part of the event, which will be the last 20, 30 minutes. And I invite you all to place your questions in the Q&A answer function on the bottom of your Zoom page. Uh, Dave Cohn will collect them all and uh, he will pose questions to the various panelists. At this time, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Our moderator, Dave Cohn, began his service as executive director of the USC Hillel in the summer of 2019. And prior to that, he had held a similar position at Emory University and was recognized for excellence in student engagement. A Chicago native, Dave was inspired uh, by his work as a camper and staff member at uh, Olin Sang Ruby Human, uh, Union Institute, a summer Jewish camp in Wisconsin. And prior to his time at Emory, Dave worked in development and strategic projects uh, for Hillel at UCLA. And he also spent years as a musical e music educator in the public school system. Dave uh, holds degrees in MPA from USC and also a Jewish nonprofit management degree from HUC uh, Jewish Institute of Research. Our other panelist, Dr. Jennifer Rogers, is a historian of modern Germany and Europe. She holds a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, where she wrote her dissertation on the International Tracing Service, the first study of this Holocaust era humanitarian organization. And she's currently finishing a book titled The Archives of Humanity, the International Tracing Service, the Holocaust and Post-War Order. And Dr. Rogers has held numerous fellowships from various Holocaust centers around the world. And before coming to the Shoah Foundation, 
She worked for the Justice Department's Office of Special Investigation, the Presidential Advisory Commission on Holocaust Assets in the United States, the German Historical Institute, and the United States Histor uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum. Uh, it is my great pleasure to turn the floor over to Dave Cohn, who will uh, moderate and introduce our student panelists. Dave, over to you. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for convening us. And it's an honor to be here with all of our panelists and with all of you who've joined us this afternoon or evening for this session. I'm Dave Cohn, the Executive Director of Hillel at USC. Uh, we are the Center for Pluralistic Jewish Life for students at the University of Southern California, fully inclusive and enfranchising to Jewish students of every background and reaching over 1,500 USC students with our programs every year. To me, it feels especially significant that these three partners have collaborated to bring this program together between Hillel, the Kasson Institute, and the USC Shoah Foundation. I believe we are incredibly fortunate on our campus to have so many high caliber centers dedicated to nurturing Jewish life, supporting Jewish people, engaging in scholarship, and uh, seeing to the entire spectrum of Jewish life, both in terms of how we live it and also how we understand it, uh, remembering and preserving what there is of our past and also creating together our future as a people. Uh, we are three of, of even more centers of Jewish life that this campus has. Uh, and if there's one thing that I've learned over and over again, and especially uh, piercingly recently, it's that we will never prevent entirely ugliness and pain and difficulty from entering into our reality. One of the ways that we can both prepare for and and transcend those moments is by building strong, interconnected, and robust centers of Jewish life on our campus and with each other. And I believe today is an expression of how we do that. And I want to thank all of you who are stakeholders in our USC community for supporting that effort. It means a great deal. Thank you again to Steve, who, in addition to being uh, the director of the institute and 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 central to today's narrative as the the uh, as the child of a Holocaust survivor, has also been a, a, of many years an incredible supporter of Hillel and of Jewish student life on our campus. Uh, thank you to Dr. Rogers. It's been great getting to know you and collaborating on this program, uh, and and for you representing and and creating such rich context and meaning for us is going to be I know a gift to everyone who's here. A special thank you to Ashley, Joey, and Kobe. Um, I, I'm not sure everyone who's on this call, but giving up two hours on Sunday is actually quite a large ask of a student. It's a, a day filled with much preparation for uh, the academic week that beckons, and it's no small thing that you're here with us too. And I also have so much appreciation for Lisa at the Casson Institute, for Amy at the Shoah Foundation, for the team at Dornsife Events that's helping us put this on. So before we get into our discussion, I just want to share a, a small snippet of my own story of Holocaust memory. Unlike the vast majority of our panelists today, I'm not personally a direct descendant of Holocaust survivors. And yet, I have seared in my memory from age 11 when I sat with my grandfather of blessed memory, who'd be over 100 years old were he alive today, like all of my grandparents born in the United States pre-Holocaust. And I had been assigned an innocuous genealogy project for my class. And we were going through our family tree. And it, it stuck in my mind forever, the moment when we reached a certain point on the family tree. And he said just a few short words, they didn't make it. And I, I, I barely even understood what what this event was at that age. I don't know if anyone truly understands this event at any age, but certainly at 11, I hadn't wrapped my head around the real meaning of, of this event. Um, but I, ever since then, I've never, I've never needed more words said to understand what it means for us today to know um, my own good fortune in my family, that my grandparents, uh, uh, you know, it's not, it's, I would never compare it to surviving the Holocaust in Europe, but by having the good fortune to have, have immigrated to the United States prior, that that is why I'm here. And had I not had that stroke of luck, I wouldn't be here. Um, and in the spirit of remembering those who were lost 
in the Holocaust as we gather here again the day after International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, before proceeding further, I do want to invite the entire community wherever you're sitting to pause, make sure you've minimized your other windows and your distractions and, and your alerts and notifications. And we're going to join in a moment in a moment of silence to remember all of those who perished in the Shoah. And not only are uh, not only the the many millions of Jewish victims of the Shoah, but the many millions more who died during those years. It's actually, to me, it's incredibly significant that International Holocaust Remembrance Day is not a Jewish or Israeli uh, sacred or, or elevated day. It's a day to remember the broader event itself, of which there were many, many victims of many vulnerable and marginalized identities. Uh, so for just uh, just 30 seconds or so, I ask everyone, wherever you are, to, to pause, to, to, to be still, and to, to sit in quiet reflection and sacred memory of those lost. Thank you. So we've set up this conversation around the idea that there's an intergenerational experience of Holocaust memory. As Steve shared before, there was the intention of having a dialogue between him and his mother, Esther, of blessed memory. And while they won't be able to speak to one another, thanks to the incredible an ongoing work of the Shoah Foundation in collecting the testimony of survivors of the Holocaust, she will be able to speak to us today and we'll have the opportunity to hear parts of her story and have that frame our reflection together. Uh, and with that, I'll invite uh, us to, to let Esther Ross introduce herself to us. Can you tell us your name and uh, spell it for us, please? Esther Ross. E-S-T-H-E-R-R-O-S-S. -S. Okay, and your name at birth? Cooper Schmidt. K-U-P-E-R-S-Z-M-I-D-T. Okay, and that's Esther Cooper Schmidt. Esther Cooper Schmidt Bros. Did you have any other names? Any Hebrew name? Esther is a Hebrew name. Okay. And your birth date? Is June 15, 1924. And your age today? 71. And the city and the spelling, please, and country of your birth? I was born Poland, Shidlowiec. It's S Z Y D L O W I C. That's in Poland. So as we as we delve further in before we before we open it up from here, Steve, is there anything else before not knowing much else that you'd like us to know about your mother? Well, um, <clears throat> this was recorded in 1995, and the first time I watched it was in this October 2023. When I went back, my mother had. Uh, at the age of 99 and a half, had decided to uh, take the chance of a operation to remove a cancerous tumor on her stomach. She survived short term, but um, it did her in a month later. So this is this was very strange for me, um, and it's you know we'll talk about this maybe later. Uh, I could not bear to watch her testimony or my father's testimony that was also taken in 1995. And I watched that for the first time with my family and my children when they were here over the holidays in December. Thank you. And I also want to introduce uh, the audience at this point to the three students who've joined us today. Uh, I'll ask each of you to to just introduce yourself briefly with your name and, and what you're studying here at SC. And also, uh, in short, you know, what your connection is to the events of the Holocaust as a, a, a multi-generational survivor. Uh, Ashley, then Kobe, then Joey. 
Hi, I'm Ashley Eisdorfer. I'm majoring in theater at USC. And my connection to the Holocaust is that my grandma is a Holocaust survivor. And I was very, very lucky in the past, I guess it was a year ago now, I was able to watch her testimony through the USC Shoah Foundation. And I wasn't able to actually hear her testimony before because she had Alzheimer's. So she wasn't able to tell us this. So I was very, very lucky to be able to watch it. Um, and I learned a lot about my family history that way. Uh, hi, my name is Kobe Russo. I'm a double major in theater and uh, PR and advertising here at USC. My connection to uh, the Holocaust is that I have two great grandparents, uh, George and Jean Starkman, who were in the Holocaust and are in the USC Shoah Foundation records. I've grown up learning about the Holocaust, either in school from my grandparents, who would tell me about their stories. I didn't really get to hear it from them. But um, yeah, that's... Hi, my name is Joey Robinick. I'm a junior studying real estate development and minoring in business finance. And um, my dad's dad, so my grandfather, Paul Robinick, was a Holocaust survivor and uh, a ton of his extended family, uh, unfortunately, uh, perished in the Holocaust. So almost three fourths of my father's extended family uh, is no longer alive. Uh, so it was definitely a serious, always brought up topic in my household. So, yeah. Thank you. And as I mentioned before, the Shoah Foundation uh, housed at USC is is uh, dedicated exhaustively to collecting and documenting the testimony of Holocaust survivors and making those accessible to all. And at this point, I'm pleased to invite Jennifer to, to share more about this and, and, and to express gratitude again, uh, because thanks to the not only to the original collection of the testimony, but the Shoah Foundation team was incredibly helpful in preparing this program through uh, reviewing and preparing the segments we're going to uh, witness of, of Esther's story. So I'll turn it over to Jennifer to share more and to guide us into our discussion from here. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Dave. And to Steve, thank you very much for including the Shoah Foundation in this wonderful, wonderful program about your mother. This year, the Shoah Foundation celebrates its 30th anniversary. In the past three decades, we've collected over 56,000 firsthand testimonies in 65 countries and 44 languages. Our collections include interviews from survivors of survivors from, among others, the Holocaust, the Armenian Genocide, the genocide in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and anti-Rohingya mass violence. All of these testimonies provide invaluable knowledge about the lives of victims before, during, and in the aftermath of genocide and mass atrocities. But as generations of firsthand witnesses pass away, including Esther, um, ensuring that these testimonies remain accessible is of the utmost importance. They foster knowledge, and they promote mutual understanding and perpetuity. And that's something that our guest of honor, Esther, addresses in her own testimony, as we'll see a little bit later. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn back to Esther and her story. Um, two of the very recurrent themes, and I'm turning this back to Steve right now, two of the recurrent themes in your mother's testimony are hunger and bread. From very early on in the occupation of Łódź, which is also called Lodz, which she had, a city in Poland she had moved to when she was very young, um, until the liber her liberation at the Salzfedel subcamp of Neuengamme, and then in post-war New York, where your parents purchased and ran a very successful bakery. Bread, in particular, is a locus of both difficult and positive memory. Let's have a look at the second clip in which um, Esther discusses bread. And you know, that's things you never forget. You can't forget. Maybe you don't want to forget subconsciously. I don't know. 
but you always visualize it, you always see it. It's always like it happened yesterday, not 50 years ago. And uh, we were, that was like the daily routine, trying to, to, to grab a piece of bread. You were hungry all the time. And there were, even when you stayed in line, there was never enough of anything to get. And and like when I worked in the factory, there was a, a, a young man, his father was the head of the factory, also all Jewish people. He said, you should go and strike for more food. So his father said, my son can tell you to do that because I get more rations than you do. He is not as hungry as you are. You go on a strike, you'll be hungry. He's going to go home. He's going to have to eat. And he was right. We wouldn't do because if we don't take it, we're not going to have anything. People were so hungry. It, 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 it brings down all morality when you're so hungry. Um. I want to direct my first question um, towards Dave. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about the meaning of bread in the Jewish tradition. Sure. I, I've been, I was recently thinking about this when I received a Devar Torah from a, a cherished colleague about one of the uh, distinctive attributes of the Jewish people, one interpretation of what makes, uh, makes us uh, holy as a people rooted in the commandment in Torah that we will thank God when we have eaten until we're satisfied. And why does God later favor the Jewish people, according to this Devar Torah? It's because we did not actually heed that commandment and insisted on thanking God much more often than that. And that's encapsulated in the motzi, the blessing before most Shabbat meals begin over the challah or any time that we consume bread. And we actually don't reference the line about being satisfied until after the meal is over and halfway through Birkat Hamazon. And we've already said thank you hundreds of times. So on one extreme, bread is associated with intense gratitude. But on the other, it is lachma, you know, halach ma'anya to reference the Passover story, the bread of affliction, uh, the association between matzah and bitterness and slavery. Uh, and I think in in the frame that Esther just offered us of uh, of scarcity. Thank you for that, Steve. Do you have any specific memories of your parents talking about the importance of their bread, uh, the importance of bread in their own experiences? I know maybe you can first tell us a little bit about when your parents first told you. Uh, I know about the Holocaust or about bread. <laughs> about the Holocaust and whether or not bread figured into that. Uh, my father never did. He never said boo. In, in my entire life, he never said anything about his experience. And my mother, um, actually, that, that was one of the... She, she never sat down and told me a story from beginning to end. I got only bits and pieces and mainly nightmares. But one of the things she did talk about often is uh, how hungry they were in the absolute, you know, the central nature of bread. And it was also one of the reasons she ultimately told me that in the end, she resented and hated the Polish people of the time more than the Germans. She said the Germans, <clears throat> they were following their Fuhrer. She said the Poles were my neighbors. And when we would go on bread lines, um, my mother would sneak in because she had... Uh, blonde hair and blue eyes. She looked very Aryan. The Jews were not allowed to be on that bread line. And she would be starving. They'd all be starving. Uh, in fact, her father eventually starved to death. And she said that she would get a piece of bread and one of, or she'd be waiting on the line and one of two things would happen. Somebody would start screaming, Yudin, Yudin, and she'd get the life beaten out of her. Or she would manage to get a loaf of bread and someone else on the line would try to steal it from her because she was only still a young girl. So um, it was a central role in her life. Uh, it was a central role in her family. And I think it also shaped her attitude towards her neighbors and the whole Polish community and to the, her dying day towards Poland and her resentment that her neighbors turned her in 
Her neighbors would not allow her to eat. Her neighbors would allow her to be beaten up with not a word. I think one thing that I would highly recommend for anybody who's participating in this in this event is if you get a chance, please watch Esther's testimony. It is it's absolutely powerful, and you'll see this motif of bread across it. How standing in a bread line ends up leading to her, her mother, and her brother's deportation. And as Steve mentioned, how Steve's grandfather passed away in Esther's arms um, of hunger. So I'm going to turn this to the students now. And I'm curious if any of you um, have, if your family members have specific memories about bread or some other specific item or event that they've recollected to you. I would say for me, from what I remember, um, my when I was watching her testimony, um, she was talking about a story of the time they were so hungry that she had to steal a loaf of bread because um, it was it was not hers to take, but she needed to. There was no other way, um, and she was caught and she was beaten for it, um, and then she ends up getting so sick. But because she got so sick, it was actually, a, a, it ended up being a good thing. Um, and really from that, I just, what I've taken from her testimony is there was a lot of weird things that allowed her to survive. And now that I'm like thinking about it, bread was kind of one of them in a weird way. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I remember. Joey or Kobe? Um, I I don't I don't know if um bread I I know bread is significant in many stories, but I think for my grandparents specifically, um, I I personally don't remember so much, but um, definitely food is one hundred percent a vital role in majority of stories. And Joey. Yeah, um, I'm not too sure specifically about bread. Um, however, a specific story that is very clear in my mind uh, is when my family was hiding in a cellar um, during the Holocaust, um, a Nazi had found them and um, had opened the cellar and the Nazi happened to be a former employee of my great grandfather's and he had recognized my great grandfather and um, had reported back to the other Nazis that there were no youth in here. So he essentially saved their lives because it happened to be a former employee of his. But in, in terms of food, I, I don't really remember much. OK, I mean, I think that, that this is another motif that we also see that there Ashley brought this up with with her grandmother as well as these these moments of of sheer luck. In getting that and bread plays a role in that food plays a role in that former employees who recognize their employers um and take mercy on them is another one as well and all of those serve as lifelines to uh to all of your family members um for esther bread is also a lifeline and things such as bread facilitated different types of relationships, including the formation of sisterhood in the camps. And we know um, there's a fair amount of scholarship that looks at women's experiences in the camps. And we know that they tended to survive in greater numbers because they formed these communities, these sisterhoods, if you will. Um, and that exposes one of the gendered aspects of the Holocaust. But Steve, your mother also discussed um, how bonds between fellow women prisoners were critical for survival, but that they also had a Janice face because a lot of her camp guards were women who belonged to the SS. And she said that they were extremely brutal, much, much more brutal than the men. Um, and I want to take a look at, at, the, at a clip where she talks about her sisterhood, but also about how other women didn't extend the same types of kindness. Tell you, when I was in Salzwedel, when I came in, I recognized a girl. She was a Czech girl who 
Hitler sent out from Czechoslovakia back to Lodz because her parents or grandparents came from Poland. And that girl became a good friend of my brother, and I recognized her. And they were there before we came, so they got the best positions. They worked in the kitchen, they worked by sewing. You know, if you work in the kitchen, you're not hungry. So when I met her, I said, you remember me? I'm the sister of Alta ben -Zion. Oh, she says, yes. She says, come and I give you a piece of bread. So she gave me a piece of bread. So I said to her, you know, I appreciate you giving me the piece of bread, but you're going to get tired of giving me that piece of bread. I won't get tired of taking it. I said, heck, but letting me maybe come in and work in the kitchen a little bit after I'm finished in the factory to clean up, to do, I do anything. She says, let me talk to my mother. And the next day she says, you know what? After you finish work, come in to clean up the kitchen. I thank God for it. And and the way they cooked the soups, it wasn't in a pot, it was a built-in pot that must have held about a thousand liters. It was huge. And when I had to clean it, I had to go with my feet up and my head and hands down so I can scrape the bottom. And whatever I could scrape out, I took it into the room. I stayed we were about 16 girls in a room, double bunkers, triple bunkers, and I would share it with all the girls. Try to help each other. Try to survive. Was there a lot of trust? Did people really work together, or was everybody kind of looking out for themselves? No, I would say we were all in the same boat, so somehow or other we tried to help each other. This is a very beautiful message about the importance of community, and particularly the importance of community during the Holocaust. Um, Steve, I'm wondering, um, did your mother ever talk to you about the sisterhood she formed? I know from her testimony that one of the one of the things that she mentions is that one of her sisters who was in Salzfedel with her actually was neighbors with her in Florida. So that shows how important yep. and unbreakable mm. that bond was over over the decades. Yeah. Well, there are actually several points that I would make from the uh, testimony. Because it is about sisterhood, uh, which they refer to, as my mother said, that everyone in the camp, if you wanted to survive, you needed a lager schwester. That is a camp, lager meat for the camp and schwester for sister. You needed a camp sister, a lager schwester to look after one another because people would get sick. And if you didn't have a lager schwester, you might not even get your food for that day and you would simply die. Uh, but in fact, there are two things here that I want to emphasize. One is the nature. Sisterhood isn't just this, you know, nice concept. It's about resistance. Uh, and when we think about resistance in the Holocaust, and I know I was guilty of this as a young man wondering, why wasn't there more resistance? And my notion of resistance was picking up arms and fighting, that I discovered resistance takes many forms. And the camp that my mother was in at Salzvedel was a munitions camp, and they were making bullets. And one of the things she told me is they had these machines that would press. You had a needle that you would press down with the machine into compressing the gunpowder. And these women had worked at the machines long enough that they knew these needles were very delicate. And if you press too hard, you would snap a needle. And uh, without ever sort of doing anything formal amongst each other, they all took turns snapping needles, knowing every time you snapped a needle, you were going to get a beating, and a really bad beating. And the more needles you snapped, the worse the beatings got. And my mother said we all took turns taking the beating because we felt that every bullet that was not made was a bullet that would not be used against somebody trying to liberate us. The other thing is, it goes back to the opening clip of uh, bread, but it's about hunger. Uh, people in the Holocaust were hungry all the time. Uh, the children 
survivors, my generation, we had to clean our plates. We couldn't leave dinner with uh, anything on the plate. And, you know, at first we were wise guys, and my mother would always say, think of the poor children starving in China, and we'd say, well, send the rest of our food there. We didn't realize that this was more about, this was a serious thing, that having been deprived of food for years, the idea of leaving something on your plate was inconceivable. And the story my mother tells about the kitchen, they didn't have enough food. And so part of courage is saying, I, I'm going to go at the end of my full work day. She went after a full work day into the kitchens. Um, and part of the testimony that we, we didn't see is she would scrape out whatever she could from the soup, the scrapings, and she would hide those scrapings and she would bring it back to the bunk and share it amongst the other women. No matter what she brought in, it would be shared equally amongst everyone. And if someone was sick, they would get an extra portion. And if your Lagerschwester was sick, they would get the first extra portion. This is about you know collective action for survival. Uh, it's about courage. Um, it's about pushing yourself beyond exhaustion in order to survive and also to help others survive. Not It's not just about you. That's what really impressed me here. This is courage for a whole group of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I think just adding on to your story about, about helping each other out, there is an instance where your mother got a particularly brutal beating and was also denied her ration of bread for the day. And so when she got back into her barracks where she was being housed, all of her sisters tore off a piece of their bread and gave it to her so that she she would have something to eat that day too. So I think that that's, that's just an incredibly, incredibly powerful sentiment um, and something that that we can all think about going forward about the, the meaning of community and helping each other out. Um, Steve, could you maybe tell us a little bit, were you aware of your, how your parents had met a lot of the people in your surroundings growing up? Um, well, I knew the couple, you, the women you mentioned, the couple you mentioned, their neighbors in Florida, they were also their neighbors in Queens. They, uh, the man, Arik, grew up with my mother. Uh, and <clears throat> after the war, uh, my mother was in Salzwedel with uh, a woman, Bella, who eventually married Arik. Arik became Bella Landau. And then I knew, um, of all the friends that I grew up with, I knew Bella very well because she was her camp sister. And they traveled at the end of the war, they traveled from Salzwedel to Munich, which is where um, even before social media, word went out that if you wanted to reconnect with relatives, go to Munich, that there were big boards posted there and uh, they would have the names of different towns on the boards and you could try to find your town. And uh, if somebody knew that a relative had survived, it would be posted there. Well, they remained friends. My mother, uh, the funny thing is, uh, Arik was um, very fond of my mother. And he, uh, my mother liked him as a friend, but not more. Uh, and instead, she introduced, when when she got to Munich and saw Arik, she introduced him, uh, him to Bella. They eventually got married. And Arik, in turn, introduced my mother to Benjamin Ross, then Benjamin Rosenwax, and they eventually got married. So these remain their closest friends for many, many years. And the uh, the other people I grew up with, other than really one, her closest friend was an American, but everyone else was a survivor. Every uh, holiday we had, my sister and I would be sitting at a table with uh, a dozen or dozen and a half people, and my sister and I with the ones with the accents. They all sounded the same. They all had the heavy European accent, um, and they were all survivors. And it was because they felt comfortable with one another because no one ever had to talk about anything. And just to kind of explain a little bit the magnitude, you talked about how when your mother went to Munich after, after leaving Salzfedel, that she heard that that was a place if you wanted to find 
family members or friends who had gone missing, that that was a good place to do it. So just to put it in context, a little bit greater context for our audience, we can't imagine this today, but when you would go to the movies or listen to a radio program from the end of the war up through the 1950s, there would be lists of names read of people who were looking for family family members or of missing family members. And they would give information where you could, you could go and find these people or get in contact th with them in some way. Um, and many of those people didn't stay in Europe. Some came to the United States, like Esther and Benjamin. Um, others went to Canada, Australia. They went all over the world. Um, Steve, as I just mentioned, after the war, your mom and dad emigrated to, well, they married in Munich, which I, we, you just saw their, their marriage certificate, uh, which I found for you. And I was really excited to see that. Um, but they got married in Munich and then they moved to the United States and you and your sister followed along a little bit later. Um, and after we watch a couple of clips, I want to shift my questions to you and our students. But the worst think of my life is when I dream that my children are small and the Germans want to take them away from me and I want to die in my dream. That nightmare doesn't want to go away and I'm so frightened. Oh, why am I alive? Why was I left alive? Why was I spared the rest of my family gone? This hunts you for the rest of your life. Nobody has to come and ask you. Like when I first came here, a woman said to me, how come your whole family was killed and you remained alive? How can I answer that? My guilt is enough. It wasn't my doom to be alive. I didn't even want to be alive. But I am. It was God's will to Somebody can tell this story, what happened. If we all died, nobody would have known. Nobody would believe that such a thing can happen. But none of us forgot. And every one of us lived with that guilt. Why me? Why was my family killed and I'm alive? And we have no answer for it. My daughter once made a paper in college and she came home, she was crying. I said, why are you crying? She says, because I feel guilty for you being in concentration camp. I says, why would you feel guilty? It wasn't you doing, you weren't even born then. She says, ma, but when you were my age, you were in a concentration camp. I says, unfortunately, yes, that's true but you had nothing to do with it. You, had, you have no right of being guilty. And it seems that the most of second generations feel certain guilt in them, unfortunately. All right, there's a lot to unpack in this clip, but the first thing I wanna do, see, your mom mentions in that clip that she didn't wanna even be alive. Can you explain to us a little bit about that and actually how she ended up alive ultimately. Well, what she's talking about is guilt and dread. And um, for the children, for my sister and I, and I'm going to guess for uh, so many of the kids I grew up with were the sons and daughters of Holocaust survivors. Um, and I think it was undoubtedly a, a similar experience. Um the one thing my mother told me over and over again, because as I said, they didn't really ever talk in a kind of systematic way. And one of the things I'd be curious to talk to about our students here, because my own uh, son and daughter have reported that it is it was much easier for them to talk to my parents, well, really my mother, about her experience than it was for her own children. That And I've heard this from others, that first and third generation find it easier to talk than first and second with each other. Because I grew up being told what I knew is every morning, and I mean for years, 
in my childhood. I remember this clearly. My mother would get up and say, I had that same nightmare, and it would be one of three variations. She would wake up in the morning and say, the SS came last night and took me away. Now, when you're a small child, first of all, what is the SS? I had no idea, but I knew it was something beyond awful, just beyond awful. Um, because then she would say the second variation was the SS came and took you and your sister away. And the third variation was they took the three of us. It was interesting. My father was never in those nightmares. It was just my mother and her children. And it left me and my sister, I think, with a sense of dread that how can we ask any questions? This this is so awful. This is beyond the pale. If if this is what she's dreaming of every night, that the SS is coming, what did she have to do to survive? What you know, at one point I asked her, you know, the first thing when you're a young man is you're thinking, you know, your mother's blonde, blue eyed, was she raped? And um I asked her, you know, was <laughs> wasn't until last year that I asked her that question. You know, were you ever sexually assaulted in the camps? And she said, no, because any uh, German soldier who would have been caught raping a Jew in the camp would have been immediately killed for um, raping a pig, for sleeping with the pig. That you, you, you didn't deserve, you as a G Nazi soldier have just soiled yourself so badly that you no longer deserve to live. So, you know, these were, for her talking about the guilt, and I know she felt the guilt the rest of her life. Why was her brother not alive? Why weren't her other sisters? One sister survived the war. That was it. Everyone else died. I had no grandparents. Uh, I had two great aunts um, and one aunt, my mother's sister, and that was it for the relatives period. Mm -hmm. um, I think your mother also, she, it, as I said, there's a lot to unpack in this. She talks about survivor guilt, but she also addresses second generation guilt, particularly through the anecdote about your sister saying that she felt guilty when she was writing a paper, because at the same age, your mom had been in a camp. Steve, did you experience any of that guilt? And then to our students, do you know if your parents experienced any of that guilt or have you had any guilt into the, the third and the fourth generation? No, I would say you bet. I grew up with guilt. Guilt was one of my siblings. Uh, and it was more than guilt. It wasn't just guilt. It was, it was guilt that made you feel you had to do you. I didn't know the concept or the, the, the term at the time, but I had to devote my life to, to come alone. As the child of survivors, I had to do something to make the world a better place. That that's the guilt. Um, your parents went through such a horrible thing. Their friends went through unspeakable horrors. What are you going to do about it? Well, I can't go back in time, but I can try to make this um, a better place. And I think it's very interesting, my, you know, when I, I opened by saying my mother used to say, you write about everything but me, it's true. I'm an American historian who's written about everything until the book I wrote called Hitler in Los Angeles, how Jews foiled Nazi plots about Hollywood in America. I wrote American labor history. I wrote history, uh, Civil War Reconstruction history. I wrote Hollywood history. But I never wrote Jewish history. And uh, it's only been in the last... Well, you know, less than a decade that I've really turned to writing about this. And now I'm writing about the post-war period, post-war Nazism and fascism in America. And uh, it will sound very corny, but I feel a calling to this in a way I never felt for any of my work before. And uh, there's no question. It's about a Holocaust survivor son dealing with the forces that sent my parents and that whole generation into camps. And somebody has to tell that history, and I'm going to be one of the people who does. Turning, turning to our students who are with us, how did the story come to you? Right? Did it feel like it came more comfortably, or did it feel hidden? Did it come through with a sense, you know, did that sense of survivor guilt set in, or of pressure, or of expectation? You know, how did this? How did you come into consciousness of this, and how has it impacted how you're living lives as Jews? 
Um, uh, okay, I can go. Um, so my, I never met my great grandmother and my great grandfather died when I was at a very young age. So I never really got to hear many stories from them directly. And, um, I feel like growing up, I never felt that guilt in a sense where like, I, my grandfather was the same age I am now. And like, why is my life less so fortunate when he was in concentration camps? I more feel guilt that I need to share the his story, my great grandfather's story, great grandmother's, and just the story of the Holocaust, make sure the story doesn't die. And I feel like at times where I haven't thought about it a lot or have talked about it with people, I sometimes feel that like, that guilt being like, no, I need to share my history. I need to share my people's history. So more in that sense. Yeah. Um, for me, I never heard any stories from my grandma. Um, and from my dad, I always wondered what was really going through his brain when he was a child and going through this, but it was so completely hidden for me. He did not tell me any stories about the Holocaust. I learned everything through my mom and it was my dad's side where his um, mom was a Holocaust survivor. So it was it was interesting when um, about two years ago, I was applying to USC and I hashed out the, the tape. My mom wanted me to watch this tape of my grandma. And for, I believe it was for one of the statements, it was like, write a story that's very important to you. And I had watched my grandma's testimony and I was like in tears and I had no idea any of this. It was, it was, it was just crazy what I was hearing. Um, and it was amazing. I got to write about everything that I had heard. And a year later, um, I had the opportunity of being on this project called A Small Light and it's uh, it's on Disney Plus and it's about the the protectors of Anne and the, the Frank family during the Holocaust, Meep and Jan Gies. And it was a beautiful story. Um, I had never heard their stories before and I was very lucky to be able to play and sister Margot, and for that process, I was just delving into every single thing about the Holocaust that I could, and I finally got to ask my dad about like his experiences with his mother, and it was the first time that he had opened up just a little bit um, about what he went through and his childhood, and he did feel that guilt, and I never felt that guilt because I never knew the stories. And at that point, that was the first time that I felt that generational guilt of like, wow, I have it so lucky. Um, and I have the life that I have because of what my dad had um, and everything that he went through when he was a child. So for me, it is also that fact of bringing, bringing Holocaust stories to light, always sharing my grandma's story that's always so important to me. Um, and yeah, I would say at first I didn't feel the guilt, but at some point it, it kind of hit me. Yeah. Um, for me, I would say sort of similar to Ashley, um, although it was my dad's side that was affected through my grandfather, um, who I had never met as he passed away when my dad was only 13. Um, after he immigrated to America, um, my mom had discussed more of my familial history pertaining to the Holocaust. Um, and it was only until recently that I feel that I've asked my dad more about it, that he's been more willing to open up about it. But growing up when he was my age and younger, obviously, um, he hadn't really talked about it much with his father. I don't think it was something that he wanted to really bring up a lot. I think he just wanted to, you know, raise his family in America and focus on the future. And um, it's it's very unfortunate because I my dad did say that he grew up with a lot of guilt. And um, I think definitely it's something that can be transmitted generationally. Um, 
and whether it's like at Shabbat dinners with my extended family or at like Passover or Rosh Hashanah dinners, um, it's always stories of my dad's father that come up and uh yeah they they lived a very beautiful life before the holocaust occurred and um i think definitely guilt is a very prominent theme when discussing this so yeah so i think a couple of the things that tie all of you together are these notions of silence but also the importance of these testimonies um and the final clip we want to we want to show Esther actually talks about the importance of bearing witness through testimony. Um, and she also shares a very, very beautiful and universal message for future generations. Let's watch this final clip and then have a brief discussion about testimony or kind of continue our discussion about testimony, memory, and even some of the changing conceptions of the Holocaust in the last few decades. What would you like to tell future generations that will see this? What would you like them to know? Not to be against anybody for what they believe in. Your beliefs, your religion should be your private thing. To love a person for what that person is. A good human being. Not because they're Jewish or they're Gentile or they're Muslim or whatever they are. If they're good people, that's all it counts, to be a good person. Why kill somebody for they believe in God? We only have one God to believe in to begin with. Some believe to Jesus, some believe to Muhammad. We believe straight to God. But it still goes to the same God. So if I pray in a temple or you pray in a church, it shouldn't make a difference. You don't kill for that. And we got killed for that, for that belief. So and you never hid the fact. I mean, you always were open with your children about yeah, your experience. They knew, yes, they knew we were survivors, right? And when they got a little older, we were telling them things about it. In fact, my son was always bugging me, Ma, make a videotape of it. Let's have it. And now we got the videotape. Is there anything else you want to add before we meet your son and your husband? No, I think I wrapped it up. Okay, well, why don't we meet your... God just... bless you for doing it. Both of you. But you're doing a wonderful thing to keep this alive. Believe me, I could go on for 10 hours and not tell you a day. It's five years of atrocity you tried to put into a couple hours. But you try to, to to take out the most important things, the fright that you had. That it, Again, a really beautiful message from Esther about loving everybody, about the importance of community, but also about the importance of bearing witness. Steve. Can you maybe talk a little bit about how you think memory and memory of the Holocaust has changed from when you were a child up until now? I know your mom said that you never, she never kept it hidden from you and your sister, but you've mentioned to me that you felt in some ways like it was, was maybe a little bit hidden from Yeah, you. it was hidden. My mother doesn't always... As my mother once said when I said, Mom, you know you lie, she said, no, I don't lie. I just tell little white lies so that people don't feel badly. Um, we knew about the Holocaust. We knew they were survivors. We knew that my mother was in um, Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, and then Salzfedel, that my father had been in Dachau, although when I watched his tape for the first time uh, in December, I discovered everything my mother had told. Well, so much of what my mother was t told me was edited, and she made up a whole story that wasn't true, that he went from the Warsaw Ghetto right to Dachau. But in fact, he went from the Warsaw Ghetto to Treblinka and to a series of labor camps and ended up on a death march uh, at the Russian border that had 8,000 
Jews, and by the time they got to Dachau, there were only 3,000 left. So, you know, she plays loose with memory, as, as many do. But I think um, what has changed, and here's where she lived the life she talked in that clip. When she went to Salzfedel, many refugees and Holocaust survivors were welcomed back to the towns in Germany where they had been. And uh, she went to Salzfedel and gave a talk to high school students there. And she told me at the end of the talk about her experience, she said they were all in tears, and they all came up to her saying, we are so ashamed of our parents and grandparents. We are so ashamed of our country. We are so ashamed of what we did. And my mother said, you have nothing to be ashamed about. You weren't alive. You didn't do anything. You didn't gas anyone, kill anyone, put anyone in a camp. Um, and you don't need to live a life of guilt. What you do need to do is live a life where you respect other everything she said. Respect other people. Be tolerant of everyone else's belief. And allow people to live the life that they want to live without feeling... Um, that they're going to be threatened in some way because their race, their religion. And she spent the rest of her life really up um, up until the last few months. She was giving talks at the Holocaust Center in Broward County, uh, who's going to be honoring her next month. Uh, she would give talks to church groups. She would give talks to uh, somehow a group of evangelicals found her, and they brought her to a whole series of talks. She would talk to anybody who wanted to hear about the Holocaust. And the difference is, growing up in the 1950s and early 60s, no one talked about it publicly. And I can tell you the moment it changed for Holocaust survivors, at least the Jewish community in New York. It happened at Pesach, 1978, when... Um, I believe it was ABC, although I'm not sure, showed the miniseries The Holocaust. And I remember sitting at the table, at uh, the Pesach table, and here were a dozen and a half of her friends, all survivors, and the conversation went as follows. If American television can talk about the Holocaust in prime time, we can now talk about it for the first time publicly. And for many of their friends, it was the first time they ever talked about it, either to their children, grandchildren, or to friends and neighbors. Um, that also shows the power of television and the power of images. You know, they all said this is ridiculous. This is the sugar-coated version of the Holocaust that we have on TV. But it's still recognizing the Holocaust and still talking to America about what actually happened. Um, and the last thing I want to say is, as a young kid, I, I'm going to say I was about 14, maybe, I went into our basement one day, an unfinished basement, so it was a little scary for a kid. And in one of the closet rooms was a uh, file cabinet. And being a normally nosing kid, I started looking through the file cabinet, and I came across these three by five um, black and white pictures of bodies piled up in ovens, bodies. Uh, it was all pictures from Dachau. And I asked my parents, what are these? I brought them upstairs, there were about a dozen of them. And my father said that an army sergeant, when he was liberated from Dachau, gave him these pictures and said, if anyone ever says that this never happened, I want you to show them these pictures. Please keep them. And uh, they're now in the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Thank you for that, Steve. Um, Ashley, Kobe, and Joey, I'm going to change my question a little bit for you. Do you have any sense of how, because your world is digital in a way that Steve's world and Dave's world and my world wasn't digital for a very long time, do you have any sense of maybe how the digital world and the availability of information 24-7 is changing our conceptions of the Holocaust. Um, the flip side of that as well is, of course, people can generate data that fuels Holocaust denial, which is part of the reason why 
testimonies are so, so important in perpetuity. So can any of you maybe, maybe think about that a little bit? Yeah, I think with, like how you're saying, people use the media for good and like for, for the bad, putting out propaganda and a lot of false images, false videos. So I think when, when it comes to the, when it comes to online things, finding things online and um, the media, it, it gets, I think a little bit tricky because it's just like now people, now people when you find something online, people want like extensive proof. They, they, it's very difficult now to see a picture and believe like, is this true? Or is this not like, I'll see a video online about, uh, I don't know what, and I'll look it up. I'll be like, is this happening? And then I'll click on like five different links. And like, if I'll say yes, then like, I'll believe it. But like, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. like growing up for me, I, I still went to, museums i heard i also lived in grew up in south florida so we had a lot of holocaust survivors come to my high school my middle school to come speak and give their own testimonies and that's kind of the way i learned about the holocaust personally but for a lot of people it's through online and through the media so people will start making these stories that can be somewhat true somewhat not so it's just, it's just kind of I think it's a very tricky conceptual conceptualizing the Holocaust just online articles or videos. I think you're right. Like definitely testimonies is the things that speak the most. Yeah. Um, I would agree with that. Uh I would I would say that a lot of my Holocaust education, I feel like was a, it it always is. It's a bit like cherry coated in school. And then I went down the rabbit hole of wanting to learn more and especially like the diary of Anne Frank that was a big like first-hand account of what was going on um but I would say it's yeah social media is very interesting you always have to triple fact check everything that you are consuming um because everything can be misleading now and I, I do feel that a lot of people see an image or a video and they just automatically think it's true, um, which is a problem. <laughs> uh, I, I would say, uh, but I would say the flip side is that it can also be used as very educational. And I have seen many positive things from Holocaust discussions online, um, videos. I mean, there's now series, films, there's, a, there's so much on the Holocaust. So when I do see videos of like people going around New York and asking people what the Holocaust is about, and then they have no idea, it actually is still shocking. But I actually think I just saw a video today of, of that. So then either you have to triple fact check that, but I would say that there's definitely uh, a lot of us that uh, people in the world that don't know about the Holocaust yet, which is very interesting, but I would say that hopefully the media is helping with that. Yeah, to sort of echo what Kobe and Ashley said, uh, I think media, especially in our generation, is a very two-pronged issue, and especially in the context of the Holocaust. Um, like, for example, like a few times I've been scrolling on my For You page on TikTok, and I see crazy things that literally are like promoting the Holocaust to happen again, or putting visceral photos of the Holocaust and being like, this needs to occur again. And then I'll swipe more and I'll see someone like meeting with a Holocaust survivor saying their story. So it's very complicated, but um, I would say hopefully, you know, positivity will win and the advocacy for discussing the Holocaust is very important and misinformation and sort of this type of media, which is very disturbing will will go away and real discussions will prevail and hopefully garner the real support and education that's needed thank you all for those responses and for all of the rich conversation we've enjoyed today i think that question in so many ways is an incredibly fitting one on which to conclude the the panel portion of the program because it points to 
some very necessary work that we have to do, right? Each of us has had our different ways of coming to understand what these events meant. And in the modern era, we see that transmitted with diminishing strength through direct personal testimony of living survivors, right? Even so bittersweetly embodied by the idea that Esther was with us a few months ago and can't be with us today. And we we can do the work of engaging with memory, engaging with those who can transmit those stories, engaging with research, with study. Uh, and, and as you beautifully put, uh, you know, you know, Joey, you know, we have to become agents of, of light ultimately. Right. And, and I think that's a message worthy of finishing on. Uh, we have a few more moments together. I, I want to make sure there's an opportunity to address questions that the audience might have for any of our panelists or follow up on any of what was discussed during this incredible discussion. Please use the Q&A feature in, in the Zoom chat if you'd like to submit a question. Uh, I do want to speak briefly to one of the questions that I saw come into the chat, which I have to confess, uh, when I first saw it arrive, I was tempted to pass on the this question, um, you know, because it's 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 uh, it would pull us away from our focus on direct testimony and memory of the Holocaust itself, uh, which is something I, I I'm I'm hesitant to do. But given where we we finished our discussion, I think it bears more relevance now. Um, I, I, there was a questioner who, who asked us about uh, the reluctance of university administrations to address head on anti Semitism that's witnessed on campuses today, uh, most visibly witnessed in the, the Flashpoint House of Representatives hearings that took place in December with three college and university pre presidents. Uh, I'm not going to unpack everything about that hearing or about what those presidents responded. I think that's a separate webinar. I do think that. Um, what our students have just shared is a guide to what our universities need to do more effectively, which is teach empathy, teach humanity, address when necessary by calling out acts of hostility, acts of marginalization, acts of harassment. Um, in many ways, I think that the, the, the college presidents in the hearing um, found themselves in a trap that I've seen administrators in as well, which is to analyze legal theory and lean on legal and policy responses to describe what cannot be done. And those are real. It's hard for us to accept at times, but those are real. But the more time we spend in that discussion, the less time we spend addressing what can be addressed, which is when students' behavior is hostile, hateful, intimidating, right? When we can promote a student commitment, as USC attempts to do, in which we're advocating that they do more rigorously around uh, our, our behavior towards one another, our ethical conduct in this community, I think that that's a way that we can all collaborate to address the issue proactively, productively with students on campus, with many partners. Um, we convened over 100 administrators from the West Coast on our campus in November to, to discuss these issues in person at USC in partnership with our Jewish Federation and with the leadership of this university. Uh, and they spent two days discussing all of the nuances of these policies. But the most poignant moment of the entire two days was when we had students speaking about the experience they've had over the last few months on campus, and there was not a dry on eye in the room. The more that we can tell stories to bring us back to what this is about, about testimony and memory and experience of the world, the more that we can tell real stories, the more we will build allies, the more that we will find motivated partners to address the hostility that any marginalized community and that Jews certainly face today. Um, I'm a, Reviewing the, the Q&A, and I'm, I'm not seeing further submissions, which to me might be an indicator that we've we've covered the ground that, that we might cover today. Uh, and with that, I will uh, ask Dr. Ross to close out our program. Well, thank you, Dave. I, I would add to that, if my mother were alive and she was asked that question about what's going on on university campuses, 
uh, I think she would say the following, that Holocausts, genocides, mass murders occur when people dehumanize other human beings, when they don't see them as uh, ordinary human beings, but as others. And it doesn't matter what kind of other there is. And that, I know, upset my mother more than anything, is why can't people simply, at the very basic level, be tolerant of one another, uh, live by the golden rule. You don't have to love your neighbor, but pretend, act like you do love your neighbor, uh, and act like you care about the safety of your neighbor. And uh, I think if she were asked that question about university campuses now, she would say, I want presidents and administrators to protect all students. I want all students to feel safe. If students want to have demonstrations, that is fine. It is their right. But no demonstration should ever call for harm, death, or any violence to any other person, no matter who you are or what's going on. I think that is the legacy of storytelling, too, and I think you're right. The more stories we can tell, the more people will listen. People listen to stories more than they listen to documents and evidence and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, this time I want to thank Dave Cohn. I want to thank uh, Jennifer Rogers. I want to thank our three students for coming today, and Dave's right, two hours on a Sunday is a long time. I understand that. So thank you for joining us. But more importantly, I want to thank everyone who has tuned in today, because the preservation of the memory of the Holocaust is not only one that touches me, that touches my associate director, Lisa Ansel, whose grandmother was a survivor, but at a time the world is witnessing unprecedented levels of anti-Semitism that we haven't seen since the Holocaust, it's all the more important for second and third generations and their children to keep the memory of survivors, the memory of what happened alive and relevant. Thank you all for tuning in today. Uh, I wish you a good night and please join us for our subsequent events. Thank you all.